Dr. Gus Vickery. Welcome to the Jason Wright Show, man. How are you, sir? I am great today, Jason, and I hope you are too. And thank you very much for the uh, privilege of having uh, this time with you. Man, I'm the one that's privileged. I tell you what, the cool, the, one of the best parts about this podcast is the friends that I'm making along the way. And I've, I've said this before, this audience has heard me say this, and I, I tell all of my guests, I'm, I'm not a transactional guy, especially when it comes to human beings. I, I like to establish relationships and friendships, and, um, and that's what this show has been for. And man, just the offline conversations that you and I have already had have been uh, have really uh, filled my heart, man. So uh, so I really appreciate that, man. Let, I think there's going to be some future, like I take like I talk about with our mutual friend James Quandaw. It's going to be like iron sharpening iron, brother. Yep, I, I don't disagree. And even just the uh, how providential it was for you to end up in Boulder at the same time as my wife and daughter, right. and for y'all all to meet and spend time together right when we've been introduced. It's really just pretty cool the way things line up. It really is, and a, and a shout out to all those uh, Alabama Kappas, right? You know, yeah, the Kappa Kappa right, Gamma's about right. Roll Tide. Even, and, even uh, though Go I'm Kappa. actually a big Georgia fan. <laughs> uh oh, uh oh, oh man. Yeah. You know, my buddy um, Philip Stutz, who uh, uh, is the founder of Win Big Media, he just posted a deal on Instagram. He had lunch with Nick Saban, and above Nick Saban's door to his office is a big Georgia logo. So. You know, in typical Nick Saban fashion, man, he is he is already planning for the rematch. You know, I would not have predicted that. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's a it's a real shocker, huh? Well, all right, Dr. Vickery, let's do this, man. Let's just geek out on some health and wellness. And here's the deal. And like I said before you got on. So my whole approach to health and wellness, if I've okay, so being a kid that grew up playing sports and then uh I was a college athlete, exercise and training by God's grace, just stuck with me forever. It just became part of my DNA. Then all of a sudden, this crazy thing that happens to all of us, if we're fortunate enough to make it that far, I turned 40 and now I'm 47. It was somewhere around that time that I really decided that I wanted to go deeper with my health and my wellness. And that's the closest thing I have to a hobby. And here's the cool thing. And I think it started about the time uh, that I just decided to stop drinking any alcohol. Now, again, I've said this on this show before. I'll say it again. It has nothing to do with my Christian faith or scruples or anything like that, that I don't drink. I don't, if somebody wants to drink, fine. I grew up in a, in a drinking family. That's what we did. For me, I just became obsessed with feeling naturally well and good and, and being clear headed. And so then I started figuring out, figuring out how to manipulate uh, the neurochemicals that we have at, at our, you know, how to understand the, the neurotransmitters in our gut and what, how to feed them. And so it just became this whole holistic integrative health mindset that I got kind of obsessed with to where now I would say probably, I haven't done any sort of study on this, but I bet probably 80% of the content of this show is health and wellness and that sort of thing. And then the, you know, to the point that the show's motto is improve all ways in all ways. You know, if you, if you are crushing it at, you know, 9% body fat, but your wife can't stand you and you never see your children, you're not doing it right. You know, if you're, if you, so if you're a, a genius and you're able to read, you know, 30 books a week, but you are, are suffering from hypertension and, and, you know, cardiovascular disease, you're not doing it right. So it's really this whole uh, integrative and holistic approach. And so, that's what I wanted to visit with you about today because, and let's just start there with, as a physician, your philosophy on health and wellness and kind of how you've put the pieces together to create, to in your mindset as, a, as someone, as an actual practitioner on how someone goes from just kind of understanding, kind of like, well, I, I eat right or I'm losing weight, but to this total health and wellness mindset. Yeah, it's a great question. And actually, the evolution of my own practice uh, is based on that experience, watching people's uh, uh, experience and philosophies of health right in front of me. Uh, you know, I'm a, trained as a family physician. I started a practice right out of residency. 
um, just a little small practice. You spend the first five years of your medical practice just, you know, do it in total imposter syndrome, you know, and just trying to gain some confidence and figure things out. So you don't really have a lot of time to think too deeply about any other thing. You're just hoping to get not hurt somebody and get some things right. And then you get in enough time and experience, you start getting pretty comfortable with what you're doing for the most part. You know what to do with things. And you have a chance to think a little bit more deeply about what are you doing? You know, what, what's happening to the population of people who are coming in through your clinic? Um, are they having a better experience of life? Are they healthier because of their time with you? And what I began to observe, of course, was that was not happening. I, I felt like I was doing good work for these folks. They thought I was doing good work. I, you know, their families would come to me. But yet, year to year, you, you know, you'd measure someone's biometrics or you'd look at their weight or you'd just do an assessment of how they're feeling. And it wasn't good. I mean, they were more tired, more depressed, sleeping worse, more anxious, blood pressure higher, blood sugar higher. And we would use the tools we've been taught to use, medications, which are a great tool. I've used plenty of medications. They can be the best tool in the box for many conditions, but it was the only tool. And so, especially when you don't have much time and you'd get something stable and then it would progress. And then what I started seeing is that, you know, people that were 35 or 40, right, we are coming in and they've got three or four chronic diseases by 35. And any, you know, person uh, doesn't, you don't have to be a scientist who studies a little bit of human design, right? The uh, human potential, like what a human being is, knows we were not engineered to be chronically sick by age 35. <laughs> that is, right. That's a big misfire right there. Yeah. And it wasn't, and a lot of times what happens right now in the healthcare system is individuals who are struggling with poor health or symptoms of poor health. It's really just, you know, thought they're just coming in for medication, right? That's a common thought. Like this person just hopes to find a pharmaceutical, the easy path, and that way that we can make them feel a little bit better. And, and that's all they're looking for. And that might be true for some people, but my experience was that's not true for most people. Most people really wanted to feel good. They wanted to not be sick, right? right? They didn't want to develop and have diabetes. And they had this real desire for health, but it was like, how could they figure it out? Because the traditional healthcare system isn't really built to help you figure that out. And because of the cost of health insurance and other factors, it was like the only resource they had. They didn't have any extra money to go spend uh, digging into other resources for health. And then when it comes to pop culture, there's an enormous amount of good information, an enormous amount, really good articles and things that are available, but which one works for you? you know? Yeah. And then people would try things, but they often just don't try long enough, right? So they try this six week you know, body transformation program or mind transformation program, and they start to feel better. And then they kind of you know, slingshot back and then they don't feel good again. And they don't understand that it takes a while to create changes in human systems. So anyway, the, the other side of that coin was me raising three children with my lovely wife, right, while we're trying to run a business, while being a family doctor, and at that time still taking call and going into the hospital and doing all of that, watching my own self suffer, you know, with weight gain and fatigue and stress and disrupted sleep. And like, you know, and I like to feel good. This isn't, this isn't fun for me. I want to feel good. And I've got years ahead of me where I'm going to have to keep grinding this out, right? Because I've got a lot of responsibilities. And so I was digging in for my own self. I'll shorten it up. But essentially, I began to really dig into these principles of human design, right? What allows a human being to thrive, to perform well, to, to comprehensively express genetically the highest performing version of themselves, right? And what inputs into a human system uh, create the inverse, you know, cause a, a human being to not thrive, to become sick, to become frail. And it became quite obvious, and I think most people knew these truths, but it was how to apply these truths in the right way and, and, and which ones were true for them to get well, that as, you be, as I began to teach my patients what I was learning, I would observe them beginning to do little bits of it, right? I realized, hey, yeah, they're willing, if they had, they, you know, they, they had confidence in me because they trusted me as their doctor. So they'd go home and they'd try what I was teaching them. At that time, like 12 years ago, it was intermittent fasting, which was completely mind blowing concept at yeah. that time. Isn't yeah. fasting dangerous? <laughs> you know? right. And yet, sure enough, blood sugar was falling, losing weight easier, feeling better, sleeping better, you know, and then bit by bit, we just kept introducing more and more. And I kept watching as, as, the, as the people who were willing to invest some time and effort to experience a little bit of discomfort of transition started feeling really good and reversing diabetes or at least taking pre-diabetes and reverting back to completely normal, which we're taught isn't possible. That's not what's going to happen. It's going to inevitably progress. You're going to have more diseases and this is just life. And thank goodness we have pharmaceuticals to try and manage those until you die. 
And I really begin to just dig into this deeper medical work because it's really exciting to watch human beings get healthier. And just what you reported, they come in and they're feeling so good. And they didn't know they could feel so good. They had no idea that they could wake up and really feel rested and restored, that they could have a strong motivation and drive to take on their day, that they could have a minimum amount of pain in their body or their gut, right? That they could, and, and to watch people have that experience and then how that spills over into their family, their community, their professional lives, whatever that might be, it just gives you a buzz, right? Yep. Like that yep. makes you feel like your work's doing something much better than just managing sickness. And I had the same experience. I, the deeper I went into all of the biohacking and everything else that we can do, and the more I saw how my body responded, oh my gosh, I, I mean, feeling good is your fork, right? yeah. It's yeah. like a drug, yeah. it's a drug. And then you, and what you learn is that for the individuals who start having that experience, you don't really have to help them that much more because their own body will teach them. Yeah. And anything that starts to take them in a different direction, starts taking that good feeling away from them, they'll stop it because right. they're so attached to the good feeling. Well, and there's so many things there that you said that just really, I'm like, I wanted to, you know, give you, throw you a big amen, you know, and not the least of which is this idea that a people not understanding that they can feel good. And so here's what I have learned in just immersing, you know, just having this, immersing myself in this whole idea of how can I maximize my body, my mind, my, you know, whatever that looks like, what order the ways. One of the things that I'm realizing, Dr. Gus, that is that we just we, we were really not made for the environment and, we, and the habitat, which most of us find ourselves. Right. I mean, our, mm -hmm. it's matching that ancestral design to the modern world. And you realize we are really, uh, for lack of a better metaphor, we're really fish out of water. We're humans out of, I guess, <laughs> the right time or era. We were made for a basically, you know, survival. And, and so that's where let's, let's talk about some of these things because they all tie together. That's what's been really fun for me is that when you try to study human performance in isolation, for example, if you try to study just the circadian rhythm by itself, well, at some point you're going to come up with what you just mentioned, intermittent fasting. I just read the coolest study that that I did, kind of blew my mind with regard to intermittent fasting, and you probably you probably seen this. So this is for the listeners. There is actually and I actually write about it in this issue of the the Vitruvian Letter, which is there was a study done of mice that basically the only difference between the, they they came from the same uh, genetic code, same same parents, everything was the same. And the two mice, one was on a 24-hour feeding window. They could eat whenever they wanted to, delivered them. The others, they were on a, I think they reduced it to a 12 or 10-hour feeding window. Fed them the exact same thing. And I think at that time, there were over 1,100, you know, peer-reviewed studies showing that all the the effects of fat and sugar and all these horrible things, right, that we kind of just kind of take for granted. Yeah, we know these things are bad for us. Well, all they did, they fed these two groups of mice the exact same diet but they fed them, but, um, and the, the, the mice that could eat 24 hours, anytime they wanted, they had all the adverse impacts that you would expect from the bad diet. Those that had a shortened feeding window. And again, I think it was actually 10 hours in the, in the first round of the study, they had no adverse impact. So in isolation, people hear that and they go, and this is where I'd like you to kind of chime in. People hear that in isolation, they go, oh, okay, so intermittent fasting, I can eat whatever I want. Well, no, let's let's go a little deeper. Why is that the case? Well, because intermittent fasting lines up more with our ancestral body and the way our body was designed to feed. And when it was designed to feed, when it was designed to rest and 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 you know re rejuvenate, you know, and and uh, and restore. And so Take that and then from just from a, an ancestral standpoint to how the body as a machine is kind of meant to work. And then let's talk about some of those things of why not just the intermittent fasting works, because a lot of people will hear that and they'll just think, oh, so they just kind of line it up with, well, do I do intermittent fasting? Do I do keto? Do I do paleo? Do I do carnivore? Well, no, what you should do is follow the the rhythm of your body, the way it was designed to operate, and it was meant to 
that's why we have breakfast is a breaking fast. You weren't meant to eat, go crush some water burger at midnight after a night of binge drinking. That's just destroying the, the circadian clock. So, you know, talk a little bit about that, how the body was designed and how we can find those levers to start pulling, to get, like you said, those patients to feel better. Yeah. There's a lot in what you just asked. If, First and foremost, yes, we are at a point where we're a mismatch for our habitats. But I do want to make the point that it's there's a it's a double edged sword, and I think you you would I know you would amen this. We actually have the opportunity with what we've learned about circadian rhythm biology, timing of eating, and all these different inputs that to actually begin to apply those principles to our lives. And it's not that hard to do, as you know. I mean, it's a lot of change, but if you just do it incrementally, it's really not that hard to do. Um, We have the opportunity to do that while we get all the benefits of what progress has given us, right? And when you put those two together, we're really in a sweet spot, right? If we take advantage of both, we have an opportunity to live as long as God's gonna give us. I don't know what that's gonna be for anybody. I don't promise a certain number of years to anybody I work with. I mean, that's in somebody else's hands, not mine. But we have the opportunity to make sure that as many years as that is, that we really are functioning at a very high level. We're having a, a life where we're not uh, just trying to deal with debility, frailty, and a system that's falling apart. It's going to happen at some point, but that might be the last three or six months, and then we're done and we move on. But up until then, we're in a situation where we can make meaningful contributions still, right? Which is a lot about what life is about, is being able to make a meaningful contribution, having a purpose, whatever that is. So yes, we're at a mismatch point, but we also know enough about these mismatches that we can actually begin to recreate the ancestral inputs while we live and take advantage of these modern environments. And can we fix all of it? No, there's gonna be a certain amount of toxicants and things that are just gonna get into our systems that we didn't used to have have exposure to, but we can manage most of them. And because human design is so resilient, robust, it can handle the little bit that we can't, you know, that we're not able to account for. It's not- Can I just fall, say fall. something real quick? Yeah. You talk about the human body. So when you start to understand, and I know we're going to talk about some gut health today and the gut biome and stuff, when you really start to understand this stuff and you you look at the the garbage that I have put in my body over the years and that people do, yeah, the body's real resilient considering the crap that it has to process. So anyway, just just to echo that point, you know, amongst all the other things that it's able to uh, be resilient to just, yeah, just the stuff we put in it is pretty amazing. But I'm sorry, Doc. I just, no, that's, that's all right. No, it's under assault. Like I marveled at how people could be so sick that I worked with. I mean, and I could see them year after year. And I'm not, this isn't a statement about who they are as a dignified exactly. person, right? Like this is just somebody in poor health who likely was born and bred into poor health, has never probably have had full nutrient repletion in their life, have lived in toxic environments all of their life, overwhelmed. They have very high blood sugars, very high blood pressure, all kinds of things that are just off. And year after year, they're still actually functioning. Right, like, and it's just amazing to me. And uh, and and so yes, these systems are very resilient, and they can heal tremendously if we just give them a little bit of the right information. Um, and that's the, what people need to know that are coming from a state where they've really let their health go. They think it's hopeless. I can't get it back. I'm 50 or 60, and I've got this much weight to lose, and I've already got arterial disease, and I've already got kidney disease. It's too late for me. No, it's not. I've seen tremendous healing, tremendous transformations in health for individuals where all of those metrics that we can look at for arterial disease, kidney disease, liver disease, fatty liver, all of them normalizing, right? People fully restoring health. And so this principle of design, yeah, human beings, like all things, have a a design. Now, we are an infinitely complex system, infinitely complex. No one could basically map it out, you know, precisely. But for an infinitely complex system, the inputs we need for thriving are relatively simple. By, thank you, God. You know, um, it's not that hard. And essentially, there's a basic equation, and it's, it's common sense. But essentially, anything that has a design, and that, and in order to function well, you need to honor that design, right? You have to provide it the information it needs, right? It has to have the right information to be able to thrive, grow, whatever. Two you have to try and minimize the amount of information that's damaging to that system, right? Like you can't get rid of it all, but you've got to at least try to minimize it. But three, and this is the part where when you get into biohacking and hormesis, you need to make sure that the right information is comprehensive, meaning you want to comprehensively express all those genetic potentials that live inside of you 
which most people have no idea what those potentials are yeah. uh, because we live in a time where people don't even want to get cold or hot, right? right? right. Or right. have to get short of breath. And like, and you have no idea how high of a mountain you could climb, how long you could hold your breath underwater, how far you could endure, how long you could go without eating. And I'm not making a case for, as a mass, that's not a masochistic case. That's a explore your potentials and see what that does for you in every single day life uh, in terms of your expression of health. And doesn't that sort, isn't that sort of why our body responds well to, we need that resistance to, it needs to struggle, there needs to, to, to grow. Am I saying that right? I mean, there, there needs yeah. to be, like with resistance yeah. training, like the, the thermogenesis, you know, people, they'll see me, you know, taking a snow bath in Boulder, Colorado and think I'm nuts. And, and yeah, it, it's uncomfortable, uh, uh, but we need some discomfort or we'll never, our body will never respond. One of the things that I do now is I sprint every morning. I mean, and it might be just on my morning walk, you know, I walk two miles a morning and I'll just take off for a, a 20 count in a all out sprint to keep my body challenged to, you know, that, that again, hearkening back to that ancestral time when there could have been a saber tooth tiger behind the, you know, the, <laughs> and then I look around, I, 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 it occurred to me this week, I was telling Jim and we were at a rest. I was like, you know, you look around, I, I think to myself of, a lot of the people I know, a lot of the guys I know my age, if they were to take off in a full sprint, how well that would go, they'd probably fall or, you know, they'd nearly die. And I'm like, that's the problem. But you still got to survive regardless of whether you're 47 or 67. So doing these things that challenge the body just to see what it can do, I think that's a lot of what, what we miss, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've, you know, prioritized comfort and how we've defined mm -hmm. comfort. And obviously you can see where that's gotten us. If you look at surveys of how people feel emotionally, physically, yeah. it, we're, not, we're not very comfortable people at all. And again, I have a climate controlled house, right? And I'm glad for that. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I love the fact that my car warms up before I get in it on a 20 degree morning, right? I'm happy yeah. about those things. So I'm not, you know, here to like say that's all not good for us, but the, all, you know, the amount of information built into a human Jenna, right? Again, the amount of potentials that we have, um, we have no idea, right? But we can see it in individuals who do extraordinary things. And not everybody is going to do every extraordinary thing. But what we all have the potential to do have at least done some of that extraordinary thing. It's in every one of us, every one of our homo, homo sapien genomes, we have that information. But if we're not requiring that information to be expressed, right? it's not ever going to be expressed and we're going to not end up experiencing the full potential that we have. Now, there is another side of that coin because I have some people who come to me who fully understand these principles we're talking about and they are high performers in life and they actually have to learn how to chill out. <laughs> like, I mean, right. they come in and they're 30 minute ice bath every day, 45 minute <laughs> sauna every day, hyperbaric chamber, full, you know, two on. I, and it's like, there is a little bit, there's a concept of hormesis where it's no longer hormesis, right? It's right. just five months stress. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, the reason you have inflammation, the reason why your sleep scores are terrible, the reason why your heart rate variability is 50 years older than you are is because you're not giving your body the rest and recovery it needs from all these stressors that you're layering yep. in. And so you have to, it is back to that balance point you made originally, right? That yep. there's, we have to test ourselves or we're not going to grow. And it's not just proving something, although it's nice to prove you could tolerate some cold or that you yep. could go without eating for a while. It's a good, it's a confident feeling knowing your body's capable of doing that for you. Yep. But it's not just about that. It's about what that translates into in terms of how our body is performing in just the normal states of everyday life. Uh, there is no doubt that when you increase that overall genetic potential, when you're just in your regular groove in your climate controlled environment, able to eat on your usual schedule, you will have better mental clarity. You will have better focus. You will be more creative. You will likely have more positive emotions and less negative emotions. You will have more energy. You'll just be a happier person. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that I want to try to do through this podcast. And a lot of the, the work I'm doing away from it is, I, it's not coming, you know, God, man, we live in a, in a society now where, you know, you get called as a, somebody that's shaming people or whatever, when really all it is, it's like, I've described it like this. I think I may have told you this when we talked on the phone in Boulder, I can't remember, but you know, for me, good health, both mental and physical 
it's like the the story in the Bible, the parable where the guy is going through the field and he finds the treasure, and then he goes and sells everything he owns so that he can buy the field just to have the treasure. Now, of course, that story is re- regarding our salvation. But what I've kind of become with health and wellness is I see someone like if I like I went to the grocery store last week and I saw this this person on one of the little carts that they from they didn't have a cane or anything so from what i could tell the only reason why they were on this little cart is because they were just so massively obese and not from a judgmental standpoint what i wanted to go look at go up to that person just my heart went out to him and said i want you to discover what i've discovered because i'm frankly nothing special i just i went through a process and by god's grace i figured some things out and realized this is really good stuff you know to, when you understand the levers you can pull to be healthy and well i want you to have that and and so that's what i want to approach everyone with and now here's where i would like you to just kind of put your practitioner hat on so i actually have someone that i know that it's a frustrating case because it's someone relatively close to me. They are overweight. They are, uh, they're both clinically diagnosed as well as constantly professing bipolar. Uh, and I think that the latter, I think, is what accentuates it's the constantly reminding everyone that they are bipolar. Just absolute horrible metabolic health, you can tell. Um, that person comes in to to see Dr. Gus for, you know, just, hey, they, they always feel bad. So you could probably pick from a whole catalog of ailments that they have, this, this individual I'm, I'm describing. How do you kind of approach that to get this person? Where do you start? Because like if me being a novice, I'm not a physician. I want to start talking to them about, I mean, I, see, I hear the bipolar and I start wanting to think, well, do we start with kind of, you know, some, there's some things you can do with breath work and the things that you do for your, for your mind. But then again, you've got all these neural receptors in your gut. Do we start getting your gut health right to try to aid that? Do we just get you out in the sunshine walking? Do we start talking about circadian rhythm? Where do you, someone who's the actual professional, where do you, how do you approach that, that person? Pray really hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Done that. But, I've, I've done that, my man. All right, well, cool. And All I right. actually do pray for everybody I'm working yeah. with. But, but yeah. let's move into like the, the actual work I really do have to do, what I can't just offload to God. Um, yep. But yeah, so that's a really, that's a great example because that's a highly complex case. Like any, yeah. you know, like the best psychiatrists in America will tell you that bipolar depression is one of the most challenging psychiatric conditions to manage. It is hard. And there are genetic underpinnings and there are a lot of underpinnings that might not be genetic, but had to do with experiences early in life. And yep. before that person had any choice in the matter. Yep. Right? And so the first thing, of course, I, what I know based on that inventory they filled out is this going to be hard and I'm going to get a lot of, uh, you know, I, I'm going to get a lot of, uh, you know, challenges and pushback because a lot of I, I, people like that, typically they, they kind of feel like they already know everything that they need to know and they're not going to, you know, and so. Well, I, and I, their, I their identity that. is so tied to the ailments. This yes, person is right. all- it's, it's an identity thing. And it's very hard to help people when they, and when whatever secondary gain, for whatever secondary gain reasons that seems to be serving them, we don't know why, because they appear to be suffering as far as we can see, but yeah. they're attached to it in such a way they're getting something from it. And, you know, we can't really figure out what that is. So the first thing I'm going to do is just remind myself, be very patient here, be merciful, be compassionate, because could you imagine walking in this person's shoes, being lost in that milieu in their mind, right? right? And then in my process with somebody who's challenging like that one, yeah, there's a lot of little things we could address that might help. Breath will help. They're probably not properly breathing. It's adding to their stress and anxiety. Their gut, if they have poor metabolic health, is a mess, which is also messing with mood and neurotransmitters. And if they have insulin resistance, which they likely do, that means that their ability to properly distribute and utilize energy is compromised, which is going to make them more tired, right? All these things are going to add up to more craving, more urges, more need for dopamine, more need for serotonin, which is going to drive behavioral patterns to go eat and do and drink and do the things that are actually creating the disease. So it is a big wound up mess, right? So the first thing you're going to do in a case like that is you're going to let them tell their story. You're just going to listen. You got to let them tell their story, right? They got to be heard. 
for sure. Anybody does. It doesn't matter if they're that complex or not. You got to let that person articulate their story of health and, you know, what is it that they're actually seeking? What are they looking for? I mean, that's what Jesus always often started with a question. You know, what are you looking for? Right. Um, and, uh, and then once that person, you know, has articulated that story and you've listened, you have to be able to reflect, of, you know, this is just, you know, the classic motivational interviewing stuff. Let them know you heard it, right? Is that yeah. right? Have I heard this, Greg? But you have to begin to retell that story of what is possible, right? And, and you can retell that story of health with their goals, their stated goals. This is what I'm really looking for. I do want to feel good this way. I do want to lose this weight. And so you retell that story and you tell it with their goals reintegrated into it, right? So, so it becomes a possibility in their mind that that could be their story of health. And then you say, do you accept that? You know, are you buying into that? Is that something you're in? And then they say, yes. All right. So that's what they want to do. All right. So that's a lot of like, just, you know, deep work that's just going on in an interpersonal engagement level. But then what I would suggest to, in terms of the practical steps we're going to take is that we have to begin to work on all these systems at the same time, because fixing one in a, in a problem like that, we're not, we're not going to get where we need to go. Right. Yep. But at the same time, it's going to be overwhelming for that person to try and dig in to every system because they're going to need to change certain aspects of their approach to nutrition. They are going to need to likely change their approach to sleep, their sleep environment. They're going to need to begin to work on mindfulness and practices. And if they're truly bipolar, they might need medication to help manage their you know, psychiatric issues. They're going to need to work on breath. They're, uh, they are going to need to work on being outside of nature and fitness and their lighting environment and all those things. So all the things you talk about regularly on your podcast and your blogs, they're going to have to deal with all of it. So what are we going to do, we're going to work out the simplest, easy for is first step in each of those categories that they're like, yeah, I could do that. I got the bandwidth to do that. I, I can commit that I would spend three minutes practicing nasal diaphragmatic breathing a day, right? I can yep. commit to that. The timing of eating you brought up earlier is really interesting because, yeah, the research you're talking about has been coming out of the Salk Institute. They are a phenomenal scientific think tank that have been studying circadian rhythm biology for decades. Mm -hmm. And the data that has come out about time-restricted feeding and how to actually uh, structure that so that we're getting maximum benefit is finally really, it's coming to light and it's a beautiful thing because we're not having to guess any longer. And yeah. there's real simple principles. And exactly what they found in that mouse study, when you eat is probably more important than what you eat. Obviously. Yeah. But, but obviously both are really important. Exactly. But what I'm going to focus on that person is I'm not going to try to get them off their cherry Coke yet. I'm not going to try to do any of that. I'm just going to see if I could get them to honor the first principle of circadian rhythm biology with eating. Could you commit to no calories within two hours of bedtime? Right. Yep. That's, we just that's, did... You're making me feel good because it's what the, that's the first thing I told Rylan, my yeah. oldest daughter in Alabama, whenever she's like, dad, I, I want to, you know, get healthier in this way. I said, all right, first thing I'm going to tell you, stop eating. Do not eat anything after eight o'clock. If yeah. you can push it, if you can do seven, even better, but just yeah. so, okay, cool. I'm with you. Keep going. Yeah. So I'm going to say, because they're like, oh yeah, I could get that done. All right. So we're going to just fix that one little input, right? You make a commitment that no food or beverage calories. You could have a herbal tea. You could have a sparkling water with lemon, but no caloric input within two, preferably three hours of bedtime. Right. And then if you can make it an extra hour after waking up, do that too, right? So that'll get you to your 12 hour fast at least. And we can push it late, further later. So I'm not even, then I'm like, but I'm not going to ask you to change anything about what you're eating. Can you just do that one thing for me? Right. And then the next step will be, of course, let's pick, let's work on moving from cherry Cokes to diet cherry Cokes. I'm not an advocate for diet cherry Cokes at all, but if I can get you there from that high fructose corn syrup, it's a positive step in the right sure. direction. It's just one little baby step at a time. Eventually, we'll get to the sparkling water and teas and things like that. We just got to kind of get move in the right direction. Would you commit to one 15-minute walk a day outside in nature without a cell phone, right? Can I get you to commit to that? You know, and you get the idea. Like, I'm going to pick off in each little place. Can you commit to that? And because if you can, I can promise you this. If you'll do this, you'll practice a little bit of breath work, spend a little time in nature walking without a cell phone. You'll stop eating and drinking calories close to bedtime, uh, get a little bit more sleep. And uh, you know, I already mentioned breath. Yeah, if you do those things, I can promise you that in one month, if you really do it, you will report to me you are feeling better. It, and you, yeah. and can I, and if, if I, you know, like, okay, tell me if I'm, I'm wrong or right on this. If I'm willing to do that, you know, Dr. Gus, I'm willing to listen to you. And also what I'm going to do, if I'll put a check or X by every day that I do that simple thing to give myself 
that little bit of a feedback loop. Now, most patients, again, this is this is the 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 real small yet big impact of what you're saying, and what a lot of people don't even realize what's going on in their brain. If I will do what Dr. Gus tells me one day and mark it on my calendar, then I get a tiny little hit of dopamine. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to associate not just the long feedback loop of healthier, feeling better, which hopefully will show up, but I get a little bit of a trigger right there and it, oh, that feels good. And then I get to look at my calendar when I see this streak and go, oh, I'm going to keep doing what Dr. Gus tells me because not only am I getting healthier, but I like I, it feels good when I get to X that calendar out. And so those are some of the things I think that, I, man, I didn't realize that were how impactful those were, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's just sort of these classic principles of how you change habits. And yeah. we know they work, right? Tried and true. They work, simple. Anybody can do them. Because if you don't do that, it's going to fall apart on you. It just yeah. is. Because as crazy as this sounds, for that individual, it is likely overwhelming to yep. do those five things we just talked yep. about, yep. which right. required almost no effort other than maybe the two to three hours before bedtime because they get antsy. And, you know, when I teach substitute patterns, I teach, okay, listen, you're going to start to feel an itch that you're going to want to scratch with a snack or a soda or a beer or something like that in that time. So we have to find the options that feed your brain some serotonin, some dopamine that don't involve eating or drinking. And I give them a list of things that they can do that could potentially, I'm like, it's not going to scratch it as powerfully. It's not as what a beer or a soda or something like that would do, but it'll likely be enough especially if you have a true intention to feel well, because if they're not executing, if they're not able to do it, I never work out of guilt or shame. That never helps anybody. I try to, in fact, Absolutely. in fact, by the time someone's arrived at me, they're spending money. They've made an investment. My understanding is they're ready to invest in their health. And this could take a long time. It's okay. Some people it's real quick and easy. Some people it could be two or three years of work together to get them where they want to go. And that's fine. We have time to do this because then you have potentially decades to enjoy what you got out of that, that effort. But, you know, in the first time, what I'm trying to do is saying, if it's your intention moving forward to experience this different story of health, to be this other version that you've said you want to be, then we're going to accept that that's you. That's who you are. You're not this other person, right? That's, you know, fat, lazy, or whatever other things that you feel about yourself that aren't really helping you. Because we know that probably most of that, how you arrived at this place where you were mentally and physically sick was likely non-conscious, right? Like it wasn't like the real you stepping out of reality and saying, this is where I want to go. This is who right. I want to be. It's likely the end product of so many habits and things and experiences that were shaped into you before you were ever really deliberately choosing who you wanted to be. And so you have to stop feeling, you can't blame anybody else. You can't blame the food industry, the tobacco industry, your parents or anybody else. That's not going to help, but you can't blame yourself either, right? You've got to unburden this thing and let it go and let's start fresh. Right? And so we're going to start on that basis. But if three to four weeks later, you haven't done a single of the things I've asked, I'm not going to get mad at you. I'm just going to say, is this, are you sure these are your desires? This is what your desires were to feel better, to lose the weight, to have calmer emotions. Are we sure those are your real desires? Because if they are, there is no path to fulfilling those desires that doesn't involve taking these steps. And it's okay, but maybe you need to go re-examine your desires before we meet again. Man. I love that. I mean, you said something, man, that I've never heard articulated like that. That is so money. You said, don't blame the tobacco companies. Don't blame the food, in, in food industry, but also don't blame yourself because generally the message is don't blame everybody else. You know, look at the guy in the mirror. I've probably preached that message to myself a million times. That's really cool because that's, I think a lot of the part of this that is so it's missing for so many people is they just take for granted the way they feel. Life is nothing but a set a, a, a set of a, a multitude of reactions, whether it's reacting to hunger, reacting to a craving, reacting to heat, reacting to discomfort. It's just react, 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 react. And yes, some of those reactions are are purposely done by advertisers or whatever the case, some of those things you mentioned. But I like that. Don't blame them, but don't blame yourself. But now that you do know that you can, you have – the, the power to take control of these things. Now you got to do that. All right. So I love where this is going. Okay. So now we've got this hypothetical yet real life in my life person that I know, at least closing some of the feedback loops, doing some of the things that you're saying. And so now you've got them in the place where 
there's trust developed, I would assume, you know, okay, I, I, I trust Dr. Gus. I like his message. He's not shaming me, which, as we know, the shaming and all of that will just push the person into the very thing that they're coming to see you for, right? Because it causes stress. So now you can work with them. Is, are you going to start tackling um, gut? Are you going to get them to start? Are you going to take that not eating past a certain time or you know, so many hours before they go to bed? Take that into another element of the circadian rhythm. Kind of which bio um, marker are you going to really start focusing on to, well, I guess, are you going to start focusing on a marker like glucose levels or something that the blood panels reveal? And then from there, go to gut, uh, breath, uh, just movement. Where are you going to go now that you've established the trust and you know, okay, this person's going to listen to me. Now I can start taking this to some real, a, a deeper level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm always working with data, right. As a medical mm -hmm. practitioner, I, sure. I don't, I mean, I, occasionally I do, you know, just <laughs> curbside, you know, whatever, what would you do in this situation? But someone who's working with me, we've got extensive data, right? They, we've got blood data on all systems, nutrients, hormones, inflammatory markers, metabolics, lipids, vascular markers. We potentially, if they agree to do it, uh, because they have a lot of gut issues, we've got a comprehensive gut biome assay. I, it, for most people, they choose to incorporate the 80-page genetic PDF report. And this isn't like an Ancestry.com or 23andMe. I, this is a really detailed breakdown of mitochondrial genetics, phase two detoxification genetics, methylation, acetylation. They don't have to understand all these biochemical concepts. I have to be able to see where the system's non-robust, innately non-robust, and like likely need some plugging, right? Need some help, macronutrient and genetics and stuff like that. So we've got a lot of data and, and that does help enormously with getting very precise and sure. where we're going to take this unique human system. Um, and it also, of course, gives people a lot of confidence uh, in the whole process because they've looked at data and you've explained what it means for them and how it's explaining both their original design genetically and how these systems are epigenetically performing right now based on whatever other data you got. Again, Dutch testing, blood testing, biome testing, et cetera. So if we see some serious issues, like really, like, like this person is really at a fork in the road, they're about to get very sick. Well, then, yeah, we're going to we're going to need to go uh, develop an order of priorities. We've got to fix this, that or the other. But the truth is, is it all ends up falling under the same umbrella. The average, what we would call like what, the average 50 year old successful 50 year old who comes to see me, who's got 20 to 30 pounds of visceral fat, like most, most 50 year olds, but they look like every other 50 year old. So they don't, for that, from their perspective, this is just normal 50 year old body. Right. And I don't care if they have 20 pounds of subcutaneous fat. What I care about is visceral fat because that's really unhealthy for the human system. And they sit down with me at the table. I can tell you that virtually every one of them. So we put them on our body, our DEX machine. We have a precise body composition measurement. So we know what their actual body fat percent is, their lean mass percent, blah, blah, blah. And they're always shocked by that because they were sure that they had 25% body fat because that's what their bioimpedance scale told them. And they've really had 34% body fat. <laughs> You know? I, I've, I've been there before. Yeah. yeah. And I've then been, I've, I've been yeah, angry at my poor doctor for, for no fault of their own. Yeah. And then I can promise you they're going, they're going to have insulin resistance because 88% of people in this, that age and that state will. So they're going to have high insulin, borderline blood sugars, high uric acid, dyslipidemia, along with that will absolutely be inflammation. We'll likely measure an elevated CRP, possibly other inflammatory cytokines, which means they really have inflammation. They don't, they're, they're and these, I like these people because they're like, I feel good. Life is good. And I'm like, you don't, it, I don't say this, but I'm thinking, wait till you feel how you're going to feel. And you're going to look back and say, I was sick as heck. Back right. then. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Really. And they're going to have down regulation of important hormones. They are, they're going to have low testosterone, probably borderline low growth hormone, possibly cortisol derangement. I mean, we're going to see all of this stuff. Right. And so in some cases, if they're really coming in because of joint pains and gut issues, they've already developed an autoimmune disease. It went on so long that now they actually have an autoimmune disease. Right. So, but ultimately fixing all that mess involves the exact same processes, right? Ultimately, you have to fix your approach to nutrition, like and individualize it. You have to fix circadian rhythm biology. You have to begin to fix your biomechanics and how you use your body and moving your body. You have to figure out how to manage your emotional health, your stress inputs, get off screens, like, you know, 
every single time you're going to end up with some variation of fixing all those things, but the path each individual will take will be a little different for them, right? Because you can't, I mean, I could just drop an algorithm on anybody and they could go follow that algorithm. And, and if they did precisely, it would probably fix most things, but that's not really going to work. It, we have to start with what are their preferences? What gives them joy in life? What do they really enjoy? What are they really attached to and why? So that we can begin to shape how they're going to enter into each of these categories in a way that, yeah, there's some discomfort, there's some challenge of change, but actually it's really doable for me. I know I can do this, right? And I, and I have reflected for a long time because I've seen so many amazing health transformations through this process. And when I first started doing it, it was just an extension of my family medicine care. I didn't know it was possible. I, I was concerned because people would pay me extra money for extra time and extra data. And I was a concern in six months, we wouldn't see any changes and I'd taken their money, you know, and I didn't know. But what I instead saw was some pretty remarkable stuff kind of blew my mind. And I continue to see these remarkable health transformations occurring. And you know, and, and as you, you kind of watch that happen, you, uh, you reflect what's happening here, because it's not that I'm that smart, not that I'm that this great of a doctor that I could heal all these people who other no, it's not that. It, and it's not just that they cleaned up nutrition, because they still have some bad habits, it's not that they took omega-3 fatty acids, all of that help. And I realized, I think a lot of what happens is that when they walk out of these encounters, they actually have confidence for the first time that in who they are and like what their situation is and that they have an ability to actually change it right yeah. they actually have confidence they can do something about it right i love that and you know the thing is it it's it's really weird that it's taken this long to get this point because this is what kind of what i see the evolution of of american healthcare in particular is kind of what you've done is because you were in the toughest of positions i've had my my family care physician hope short is a is also a, a dear friend and We've had those conversations. You guys go to medical school because you want to practice medicine. You didn't sign up to be a small business owner. That's, that's my gig. I wanted to be a small business owner, an entrepreneur, wasn't smart enough to be a doctor. You guys, it, you find yourself, you, you mentioned it, you three children running a small business. And then also the, the healthcare industry, kind of the, the legacy healthcare industry is so, so narrow in the lanes. Like if you're and so to where, and, and just the, the opportunity costs, like you said earlier, You've only got so much time to have somebody come in, diagnose, they've got the flu, they've got a cold, they've got allergies, whatever, help them get some medicine, get out because you've got a list, you know, as long as my arm of other patients that are already mad at you because they can't come in, which is really shortchanging the knowledge you have. Because, I mean, how many people do you have on a daily basis? You're a primary care physician that people come up and ask you about orthopedics. Well, I guarantee you, just because you are not an orthopedic surgeon, you have a far better understanding of orthopedics than I do. You know, it's getting to really this whole integrative health movement that I see happening. It's, it's really leveraging the knowledge that you as a physician have to take a more holistic approach, which I think is really cool. And, you know, uh, let's, and let's, I want to understand better. You mentioned it before we got on as part of this mix, the peptides that, mm -hmm. and, and the, and the bioregulators and what kind what they can do for the body and when they should be introduced and just kind of just let's just sit on that as a topic and, and, and mix it in with this conversation and how we are but it's something i'm really curious about yeah this it's a great topic because people need more awareness about this class of therapeutics very safe actually natural in a sense that our human genome encodes these various proteins um, and have a very powerful impact now, where you don't drop it in is on an individual who's not going to make any changes, right? Because if, if a person has all these things we've just spoken about, and they're not going to do anything to help their human system, a peptide's not going to do anything for them. It's just not going to help. It's spitting in the ocean, basically. But if a person is embarking on that process of change, peptides can do a whole lot to accelerate healing of human systems. So a peptide is just a chain of amino acids. It sounds like a fancy word, but it's really just a chain of amino acids. Any chain of amino acids is a peptide. Now, if it's more than 50 amino acids, it's a protein, right? And so, you know, hormones and things like that are all proteins, enzymes. And if it's less than 50 amino acids, it's a peptide. And there are all kinds of dipeptides and tripeptides and other size peptides. Now, our body doesn't just produce, you know, enzymes and proteins and hormones and things like this. It also produces smaller little snippets of, of chemical messengers that are called these peptides that they go out and they have a target tissue or target receptors and they begin to modulate the system in some way. 
typically a very brief, subtle signal, not like a big, powerful signal the way a hormone sends, but like just something very subtle. It's a nudge of the system. But as we age, we produce less of these peptides and some of the, tar some of the tissue of origination of these peptides involutes like our thymus gland, which is the hub of our immune system. As we age, it atrophies, involutes. We just don't have as much thymus activity. And as we age, our immune system becomes weaker, more senescent. We have more problems, right? And the thymus produces an enormous number of peptides. And we can reintroduce into the human system thymus-derived peptides and make, you know, some powerful, uh, have some powerful balancing activity for the immune system. Uh, same thing with other peptides that work on the pituitary system to improve growth hormone production. So there's a long list of them. So if I have somebody sitting in front of me who is very serious about the process of transformation, they are ready. And we're, and, and let's just pretend for a moment it's a metabolic health case, because I, I see that all the time, right? They need to lose 30 to 40 pounds, it not, I mean, right away, but over time, properly. We don't want them to lose any strength while they do it, because that's not good. Most people will end up losing muscle mass if they just use a calorie restriction diet, and that's not going to end up good for them. So we're going to try and keep or even build lean mass while we lose weight, which is something the human system doesn't like to do, but it can do in that circumstance. And they've got some inflammation and some gut issues, um, you know, insulin resistance, all that. Well, obviously we'll have done the lifestyle coaching around here's where you're going to change your diet, this, that, or the other. And even potentially in targeted supplements, right, to address things, nutrient deficiencies, possibly glucose disposal agents like berberine and others, if we can want to help insulin resistance. But we can also begin to add in the the peptides. So if this person has a lot of inflammation, both gut musculoskeletal, we would often put a, use a peptide called BPC-157, Body Protective Complex 157. Very safe peptide, one, something you can use longitudinally. One of the few you can take in a capsule or use via injection. Because many of these peptides are 30 or 40 amino acids long, a lot of them you cannot take orally because they would just get broken apart into smaller peptides in the gut. So a lot of them you will do injections, but it's really easy, insulin syringe, subcutaneous, anybody can learn to do this, real simple. But we would probably start them on a BPC-157 because that can heal the gut. It can help with gut inflammation, gastritis, uh, the leaky gut, you know, all of those things. Like, so we can begin to at least get some stimulus to heal the gut. The original site of secretion of BPC-157 is the gastric juices. That's where it's made in the human system. But we're also going to get a very powerful anti-inflammatory stimulus in that human system. We're going to reduce musculoskeletal inf uh, inflammation, and we're going to increase the sensitivity of growth hormone receptors and also initiate some good repair cascades. So we're going to really help the body begin to heal. So that's going to help them feel better because, uh, you know, an integral part of their plan is to get back into some exercise and they're going to move a little faster and better if we can help re resolve some of that inflammation. Right. Well, I'm also probably in that individual, we're likely going to see that they have a low testosterone level, especially if they're over 50, and we're likely going to see that their growth hormones on the lower side of normal. And so now we're going to try to take an individual who's probably got sleep dysfunction and all kinds of other issues and have them actually trying to build lean mass while they lose visceral fat, while they reverse insulin resistance, which is... The, the dietary program I'm going to give them is, oh, here's your keto diet. It is a precisely programmed diet, right? Fitted to them that they know they can do. And, it, and there are nuanced differences for everybody, but they're going to go follow that program. Well, I'm probably going to either use, if they're over 50 and it's really low, we're probably going to use testosterone, right? Which is a hormone, not a peptide. Or we might use something like HCG or inconophene, which could work through the pituitary system to improve testosterone production. Because it's going to be hard to gain muscle and lose weight with a low testosterone level. Yeah. And hard to have the energy, the motivation, the drive, the dopamine you need with a low testosterone level. So we're likely going to use either a peptide or direct testosterone. But we also might use one of the growth hormone secretagogue peptides, like tesamoral and ipamoral or CGC-1295, which can be injected at night before bedtime and will send a stimulus to the pituitary gland to increase your growth hormone production. And I follow those growth hormone levels when we do this. So we measure it through something called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one. And a person, let's just say they come in, this is not uncommon, this person's IGF-1 level at baseline is 70. That's pretty poor. That's like 20%, 10%. So we'll use this, uh, one of the, whichever peptide we pick, and they'll start using it. And three to four weeks later, we can measure an IGF-1 level 130, 140. Wow. Substantial improvement. And of course, that individual, what they're finding is that as they're starting to initiate gym workouts, you know, I'm going to have them doing some form of strength training. They have to, right? It's not just going to be aerobic endurance. They've got to start doing some resistance. Um, they're going to find that they're recovering faster. They're sleeping better that they're able to work out a little harder, a little longer. And that is the end result of that is that they're gonna actually gain strength faster. 
And in the meantime, the like the ones like Tessa Moreland have a very strong lipolysis component. They will start liquid helping liquidate visceral fat if you are following the right dietary program, which typically is calorie cycling and pro, you know, so we have them in a calorie restricted state, proper timing of eating, right amount of protein. So we're not creating a, too much of a catabolic stimulus for the human system. While we start increasing physical activity and we pulse with these peptides, we can get amazing acceleration for them, right? Feeling better, faster, seeing results faster, healthier human system in a very safe way, which just simply catalyzes them taking the next step, next step, next step. They don't have to wait three to four months to feel better. They can feel better a lot faster. And then just one other, because there's so many different peptides, but if they come in and they've got immune dysregulation, like so many people post COVID, immune system dysregulation, inflammatory cytokine responses, mitochondrial issues, we can use the thymus derived peptides like thymus and alpha, thymus and beta in conjunction with BPC-157. And we can greatly accelerate rebalancing of the T helper cell, cell system of the immune system so that we can reduce autoimmunity and you know, improve overall immune system function while we substantially reduce central nervous system inflammatory cytokine responses with thymus and beta plus possibly vascular inflammation, a lot of other factors. Um, and then the BPC again, and we can often see people you know, get, go from like just brain foggy, wiped out in pain to within six to eight weeks, feeling like they're 80 to 90% better by wow. using that. If they're also doing what they need for their body, right? They're, they're doing what they need to do. So the body's getting the right information and not the wrong information. So these peptides are really powerful and can make a huge difference in someone's healing journey. And for a biohacker, a bio-optimizer, right? They, they just help you go to the next level on a regular basis, yeah. you know, because it's not, you don't have to be sick to use them. Now, the bioregulators are a unique class of peptides coming out of Russia. And in, in the next two to three years, these are going to be huge unless the traditional system tries to squash them out. The FDA has already ruled their nutritional supplements incredibly safe. 23 different ones, all derived from different tissues and organs of cows that the St. Petersburg Institute in Russia, harv they raise the cattle themselves, harvest the organs, tissues, have a, their own confidential process, how they concentrate the peptides in these little capsules. And there are a lot of different protocols and stacks you can use. So you're taking these orally over time. They don't work quite as quick or initially as powerfully as these synthetic peptides. When I say synthetic, meaning they're synthetic because they were created in a pharmaceutical manufacturing, but they're actually analogs of natural peptides our bodies produce. These are actually natural. They're getting derived from animal tissue. And so, but they work in a more subtle way on a deeper level because they're actually working at the level of genetic expression. These specific peptides, and they've done all the studies to prove this, they've been studied for close to 50 years now. You take them in capsule form, they pipe, they go right through the gut into the bloodstream because they're very small, three, four amino acids long. So teeny, teeny little peptides. They travel, traverse the bloodstream right through all your different tissues and they only enter their target tissue, which is amazing. They don't compete with each other. So you could take a stack, the longevity stack is like the pineal gland for circadian rhythm function, mm -hmm. the thymus for immune system and blood vessel. That's the basic longevity stack. And the reduction of biological aging markers, the healing, the restoration of circadian rhythm, the melatonin, it's just phenomenal the data, what these things can, can do for people. And they, so they each go to their respective tissues. They cross the cell membrane, cross the nuclear membrane, begin to interact directly with the DNA and increase protein synthesis. And they truly begin to restore function to tissues that are sick or not functioning well, or optimize wow. function at pH. Really amazing. The retina one, some of the data I saw in like macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, the, the brain cortex one for people who've had traumatic brain injuries, strokes, uh, the increase in brain derived neurotrophic factor associated with it, the neurotransmitter balancing of glutamate, GABA, serotonin, remarkable. So yes, somebody that I'm working with that is, you know, the first person, the first illustration used is a very hard illustration. But the truth is I would consider a, a bioregulatory peptide stack for that person, because that's something easy for them to do. And it's incredibly safe. It's not a drug. And I'm not going to hurt them in any way, shape or form. And I could give them some hope that on a, like a fundamental genetic level where they feel like they're flawed because they have bipolar disease, yeah. that we could begin to create some changes for them that will help balance out some of those emotional swings, right? That could help their metabolic health improve, their pancreatic function improve. Um, so I would probably introduce something like that for that individual if I felt they were serious about making a commitment to graduated change. So peptides are amazing. 
Um, we only hope that we don't have uh, regulatory bodies try to stamp them out under the influence of the pharmaceutical because yeah. that would be yeah. the only reason to do it would be because the pharmaceutical companies don't like them. The reason you won't hear about them is these, you can't patent these. They're natural therapeutics. And so nobody gets the opportunity to go market them on television under a brand name and sell them for $3,000 a month or something like that. Instead, you know, they cost 100, 200 bucks, you know, to use for a month or something of that sort. You know, I tell you somebody who would be a good, uh, a good uh, user of this is okay. So my, uh, my stepmom, she had three years ago, this, well, three years ago, tomorrow, next month, I guess, a, a, a massive stroke. And she, and she has come back. I mean, she's, she's back. She's got mo all of her motor skills back and everything. And her speech is great, but she's still in that uphill kind of climb, not, not mm -hmm. back 100%. And so and it's funny, my poor parents, as you mentioned, two, two things, my dad's got macular degeneration and then, uh, but his is an age onset. His is the other one. There's a wet and there's a dry and his is the yeah. one that's the, that's not age related. It's just mm -hmm. bad, bad luck of the draw. Um, but I think with her, that might be a good yeah. idea. Now she, you know, and so, so that I'm understanding correctly because, all right, so where the mitochondrial health really comes in and, and then restoring the tissue and it's me trying to figure this out, doc. So just say, <laughs> you know, Jason, good, nice try. And I'm okay with that. So one of the things you mentioned there is, you know, weight loss in and of itself. And if you lose muscle and weight at this and, and fat, visceral fat at the same time, then eventually our body going back to that ancestral mode, tell me if I'm wrong, it, you, the chances of gaining more weight later or better because your body's gonna go, okay, there's less muscle. So we need more fat on you. So your body will crave more eating and you can potentially put the weight back on easier as opposed to what you're saying, which is keep the muscle while losing the fat. You don't have that adverse impact. And also what this allows you to do, these peptides can help you use and engage tissues to make it so that that um, that extra muscular, even maintenance, not even gain, but yes, I'm gaining some more muscle mass, but the actual maintenance of what you have so that during the actual weight loss process you don't lose the muscle it's 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 easily easier to to keep because you're engaging tissues that have not been maybe have been dormant for a while or were weakening um is that am i kind of understanding as far yeah, as overall I mean, the performance like, yeah so we're yeah obviously we're get, using hormones or in, influencing hormones through peptides that have the influence on tissues got That's it just yeah being a good scientist um but yes, it's super important because the reason, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why when people go onto like a very structured, serious calorie restricted diet for six months and they drop 70 pounds, but then after that they struggle or they start regaining their weight is obviously just with loss of body mass, any body mass, yeah. our metabolic rate drops. It does, right? Like a person who's really, really heavy has a very high metabolic rate. They will eat more to stay at their current weight because they have a much higher metabolic rate. Right. And so that's it. So, but, uh, you know, if you only use the calorie restricted mode and especially if you're using calorie restriction and not really loading protein right now that gets down a rabbit trail because there's all kinds of ideas around, you know, mTOR and protein and aging and all these other kinds of things. That's a different conversation. If you're talking about human longevity, I can get into a conversation about catabolic, anabolic, mTOR, AMPK all day long and talk about protein cycling. But the most important thing for this person's longevity is to get rid of the visceral fat and reverse insulin resistance, right? Yeah. Then when they've done that, we can talk about protein cycling and all that kind of stuff. Until then, while they lose the weight, then the data incontrovertibly, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, supports this. You have to go heavy on protein in a calorie restricted state so that your body does not catabolize muscle and bone and lean tissue, right? Yeah. Now, going heavy on protein in a calorie restricted state is not enough. You also has to create, create a stimulus for bone connected tissue and muscle that it is still required, right? Because deep in the brain where all this stuff is regulated, it doesn't know the difference. It doesn't know your intention is to lose weight and keep muscle. All it knows is what demand pressures were put on me today. Yep. Yep. And from an ancestral perspective, if the demand pressure was, I didn't have enough to eat, but I did have plenty of protein and I had to move a bunch of heavy boulders. Well, your body is going to keep the muscle. It just <sighs> will. It doesn't want to. It'd rather just go ahead and lose a little muscle along with the fat. So it's keeping its reserve, but it will do it if the demand pressures of life basically are information that says we have to keep our strength. 
while we lose this fat. We have no other choice. The survival depends upon it. And the basic formula to make that happen, and it works every time. I have countless case studies before and after with DEXA. I present these when I teach at Precision Health Conferences. Here's the data. Here it is. Here's what happened. And it's the same formula every time. A certain amount of calorie restriction, whatever that person will tolerate, right? Possibly with some calorie cycling just to make it psychologically easier. Give them a day, not a cheat day, a day or two, but let them eat a little more day or two combined with an appropriate protein for their size, weight, sex, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it could be 100 grams, could be 150 grams, could be more, right? Combined with consistent resistance training. Uh, yes, I wanted to be physically active. I want to take walk in the woods, play tennis, play golf. I want to do all the other things they love to do, but we have to go resistance train, period. Yeah. I mean, and if we can do that, and follow that formula. And then we can accelerate it with peptides and other things. It's amazing. I, the, my most recent example, I'm gonna present this one at a conference in May because it's just such an astounding example. 55 year old guy, super successful in life, flew in his plane to see me. You know, I was like, oh, wow. Um, and uh, came with his wife, wonderful person. And his initial deck say he was shocked when he found out I was 32% body fat, most of it visceral fat. He's like, oh, not me. I'm, I look much better than all the other guys I work with, you know? and. Uh, insulin resistant, blah, blah, blah. So I put him on this formula we just talked about, individualized for him after his genetic review, targeted supplements. He I did not, we did not use testosterone, but we did use tesamorelin, the growth hormone security guard we mm -hmm. talked about. And that was it, right? Besides targeted supplements for his little areas and tesamorelin, cycles of tesamorelin, he followed that formula. Six months later, he flies back, his dex, his body fat has gone from 32 to 18%. Right? Wow. So he's got 14% body fat in six months. Now, usually what you'd say is, oh, that was terrible for you. You're going to have a, ter a metabolic rate slow, blah, blah, blah. His lean mass had gone from 133 pounds to 144 pounds wow. without testosterone, right? Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. that's impressive. Now, he did it to a T. He did everything that I asked him to do perfectly, right? And But that's okay. I mean, it'd be fine if you did. You didn't do it to a T, but you got 70% of those results. That's still pretty good. Yeah, so 14% drop in body fat in six months while gaining lean fat, 11 pounds of lean muscle. Feels great, happy, mood good, not hungry, not like, oh, when can I start eating again? And of course, his blood metrics look beautiful. Insulin resistance completely reversed, blood sugar lower, inflammation gone, everything just beautiful. And then now I, what I have to encourage him to is we got to get you actually eating a little bit more. Right? Like, and that's the hard part because psychologically he's gotten attached to this. And you know, this uh, calorie restriction is really good for us. And when we learn to tolerate it, a lot of times we just feel better when we're calorie restricted. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. More, more energy, more cl yeah. clear yeah. ahead. Oh, it, it has been a game changer for me and to, to the point where I'm almost like, I try now to front end front load my, my deep work for, for morning and through up to about noon, because I know at some point I'm going to have to break my fast. I'm going to eat lunch or whatever. And I don't care how small it is. I mean, obviously I'm not going to eat a big old huge lunch. It's going to knock me out, but anything that i eat i know the and besides that you know peaking around three o'clock anyway and then it's gonna start the downward trend you know until bedtime i'm like almost afraid to eat sometimes so i'm like i don't want to lose this energy that i've no, got going no. it, and that's where we get to because calorie restriction is good for us and we yeah. can often when we, we get the metabolic equation wrong all the time we eat too much we know we eat too much oh, yeah. but it's not one-to-one -one. as we age our body can do just fine with less calories we yeah. won't like you probably had the same experience I have. I'm 52 now. I weight train three to four times a week. I, put, I, I do a lot of work, take long walks with my family. I mean, very busy. I probably burn close to 3000 calories a day, but on average, I probably only consume around 2200 calories. Oh a yeah. Day. yeah. Yeah. And yet my weight's not changing. My muscle mass isn't changing. I'm not hungry. I'm not tired. Right. It's very clear that metabolically my body is doing just fine with that equation. So if I was eating 3000 calories a day, I would likely be gaining fat. Yeah. You know, and so, and that's different for everybody. For some people, really high metabolic rates, they're just going to burn through the energy. But the challenge is for like that guy going forward and for guys like us is that there are times where we need to eat. We need to give that stimulus of, yeah, we've got more than enough energy to give our body because we have to occasionally send that signal. All is good, right? The harvest was, <laughs> right. was plentiful. And, and, you know, but we don't like doing it because I mean, it feels good to feast. I love a good feast. Yeah. But yeah. the feeling after a feast is like, uh. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, let's, all right, real quick, we talked a little bit before we got on about, so the, the, the age of COVID, I think, uh, well, this is, you know, Captain Obvious statement here. It's taught us a lot of things. But one of the things that has been kind of interesting is that 
the supposed experts that were that we listen to or told to listen to all the time, there seemed to be so little talk about metabolic health and its impact on COVID and how and recovery. It, look, it, it, with this the, the the latest you know Omicron when it came along, everybody's going to get it. It's become you know at this point where you, it's not about getting it; it's how you're going to be best suited to survive it and thrive and get it over with quickly. So what are some of the things that, from a practitioner standpoint, as you've watched all this, that have come to light through the era of COVID and possibly some of the things that you've been able to incorporate in your practice for those people that i got to believe you've got patients coming in going, all right, if I get this, what do I need to do to survive it, you know, without not just from therapeutics, but if there are therapeutics that you've seen that, hey, this, it, the, the, the correlation of success and this therapeutic it's there. It's undeniable. You know, just what are some of the things that have come to light for you and your practice through the last couple of years? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, one, you, the, you when you first started introducing this question, you mentioned metabolic health. Yeah, obviously, we know that the people at greatest risk, other than elderly, you know, severely immunocompromised, were people who were dealing with excess weight, obesity, diabetes, metabolic health issues. And we know why. Individuals with metabolic health problems, diabetes, and obesity have immunosenescence similar to someone who's older and frailer. It's just part of the situation due to the inflammation. So, you know, it, we, we could... You know, both grandstand about the big opportunity given the trillions of dollars that have gotten spent through this time to have actually invested that in reversing the metabolic health trend in our communities and how what that would have meant for our populations, right? And the reduction in healthcare costs, the improvements in health and human performance, but that didn't happen. In fact, it hardly got mentioned. So, you know, uh, the people who I was working with, you know, they, uh, without, again, shaming at all, it was like, this is your opportunity. If you're concerned about this virus, the number one thing you can do until the day possibly you get exposed is let's lower your blood sugar, right? Let's lose that 10 pounds of visceral fat, right? Let's get you into a better metabolic health position. And let's also like, even though this is stressing you out, let's really work on your spiritual life and stress so that you're not feeling overwhelmed and in fear all the time, because that's going to set you up for a bad outcome as well. Let's get a little more sleep, especially in the beginning with the lockdowns and everything's turning off. This is a perfect opportunity just to tune out a bit, have an evening where you just go take a long walk with your family or by yourself and go to bed early, get some rest, right? Um, so a lot of those things. But then, of course, there were a lot of potential nutritional supplements that could make a big difference for people. You certainly should know your vitamin D status. How that hasn't become a public health broadcast message, I don't know, given that most of the best health systems checked vitamin D status upon admission if you had COVID and begin to treat you right away with high dose vitamin D if you were deficient, right? So right. clearly we knew in the traditional system vitamin D was affecting outcomes, but nonetheless, it wasn't. But, you know, obviously knowing your vitamin D status and optimizing vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, critically important for inflammatory cytokine responses. And cytokine storm was part of the mechanism of decompensating COVID, right? So we can test omega-3 status. Well, or you could just assume you need them and go ahead and take a high quality omega-3 fatty acid product, which every single human being I've ever tested, other than James Quandall, believe it or not, Really? who was not taking omega-3 supplements, was deficient in omega-3s. Yeah, really? and James will be glad that I said this because he <laughs> really was, and I was astounded because I've not yet had a person who on diet alone had an optimal omega-3 index in their cell membranes, but he wow. did. Yeah. Way good to go, you, James. Uh, good, yeah, exactly. good job, James. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so that, right? And then of course, vitamin C, making sure you're getting out of vitamin C and potentially even more if, if you needed it. And then there was elderberry, which has immune system properties that you could cycle in and quercetin, which also, so, you know, there's a list of supplements and it's, you know, and they're more curcumin, vitamin A that people could begin to layer in or cycle. I didn't, I felt like this is going to go on for a couple of years. So it's not like you need nine immune supplements. You're going to take every single day. I just encourage people to cycle these things over time, or if they had exposure or the beginning of symptoms to begin to get on a protocol right away. Yeah. And, um, and then, uh, obviously exercise, right. Huge, but not exercise to the point of stressing yourself out, but proper, uh, amounts of regular physical activity, sunlight, time and nature and all of that. But those were all, you know, the first approaches. Now, most of the patients that I worked with also were going to go ahead and use immune, uh, immune modulating peptides like thymus and alpha. Um, it was a shame because what happened is thymus and alpha, which is a remarkable peptide. So good for so many people, really helps people with autoimmune diseases. 
but it got caught up in the COVID hype. I never sent out any public announcements. Hey, everybody should be on Thymus and Alpha for COVID, but apparently some did, and I'm not blaming them because it was actually a good idea, but it got caught up in the politicization, just like hydroxychloroquine, and the FDA came after it. Without, it's no known harm, no adverse effects, but they basically said cease and desist all the compounding pharmacies. But you can still get it from a very reliable manufacturer out of Canada. So, you know, a lot of my patients were going to go ahead and use cycles of thymus and alpha just to go ahead and leverage towards a healthier immune system, more robust immune system. I get it. I'm kind of getting a little long in the tooth here. I don't know if I'm answering your question directly. No, I think it's perfect because those are the things that, like, there were, gosh, I didn't count, but there were several of those that I had never, I had never heard of Edelberry until uh, till COVID. Mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd never heard of uh, a lot of these supplements, not just like you said, not just the ones that caught the headlines because of, you know, Rogan or any of that, but just some of the other things that you like knowing that, that most people are deficient in omega-3 fatty acids. I did not know that, that that's like a, it's normal. You should be supplementing that, not just for, for, you know, increased better, you know, above average health, but just to hit the certain, hit, hit the benchmark. You need to probably doing supplementation. So that's why I wanted to bring that up because it is, it's just a weird time. And the thing that I would like to, the message that I have had to take to heart that was real hard for me was that, you know, it doesn't have to be a soul crushing workout regimen to be in optimal health. The things you mentioned there, getting in sunlight, going on walks, going to bed at a reasonable hour, don't eat late at night. These are things that can, I mean, and, and it's sad, but the bar is so low that if you will just implement those easy, that low hanging fruit, you'll be far and away above a lot of the average, you know, mm -hmm. people out there who do, who think, well, I can't, I don't have time. They'll, they'll say, I don't have time to go to the gym. So therefore I don't have the time to do anything. It's just kind of this binary, you know, it's one or the other. And I don't, and, and and I think that's one of the things, and for me, you know, like today, I, I went on a, a long walk with a buddy of mine and I'll probably do some sort of a light cardio workout. Uh, ben Greenfield and I work out in my garage every day through his, through the ladders app. I'm on team boundless, you know, so that's, <laughs> that's the closest I get to actually get to work out with Ben. But, um, but that's, you know, I'll do resistance training on that deal for at least three days a week. All the rest is going to be some cardio on the other days, but that's the message I want to get through to people and, and having you say that. And then I want to let that be a segue into your book, authentic health. And I'm going to read the exact title, authentic health, the definitive guide to losing weight, feeling better, mastering stress, sleeping well every night and enjoying a sense of purpose. The thing I like about that title is brother. If that doesn't reiterate this show's motto of improving all ways in all ways, then I don't, I don't know what to, to talk about. So kind of what's the quick Ted talk elevator pitch for your book? I think it, it's probably kind of encapsulates a lot of what we've talked about here, but just try to just kind of give just an, a broad overview of your philosophically that somebody would find in authentic health. Yeah. Philosophically is the right word. Cause when people ask, I'm like, this was my philosophy of health yeah. or it is my philosophy of health, which was learned in the trenches of caring for, you know, I, I'm 20 years in now, but for over 15 years, seeing well over a hundred thousand patients in all kinds of different contexts with all kinds of different conditions, conditions across all stages of life. Right. This was what I learned in the trenches, like seeing all these really good people, trusting me, digging in, high, traditional high volume, what I used to do, all the, you know, heavy schedule, we're flying around, not eating, not drinking, right? Studying what happens for individuals. Wow, at five, six years in, I begin to introduce these ideas to people, right? And seeing what would happen, like what actually worked in human systems that I was caring for. So not instead of going out and just reading double blind studies and saying, oh, here's what it looks like. This is like actually what I observed in my human lab. Right. Yeah, right. And and what I realized is that this is basically a um, a kind of a comprehensive approach to the basics of health. Right. There's nothing about peptides in that book. Right. There's nothing about biohacking, photobiomodulation, hyperbaric. Gen None of that is in that book. What is in that book are the elementary lessons that apply to every human being, regardless of our genetic differences. That was that book was written so that everybody could say, yeah, I could follow this advice in this chapter and I'm going to get healthier. It will work for everybody. And I started, as you know, in the mind, because it all starts in the mind, just like with this podcast, we started in the mind. Like, what do you actually want? 
right? What is this your desire? Because if this is your desire, those things on the front of the cover, then I can promise you this roadmap will take you there if you follow it. And if you're not willing to follow this roadmap, which is a pretty simple one, then you probably don't desire those things. Sorry, but you don't. You're looking for something else, right? Yeah. And nobody's going to be able to help you until you want it. Right. Yep. And, uh, and these were conversations I have with people over and over again, because I was passionate for them. And if I'm the only one in this examining room, passionate about your health, <laughs> then this isn't going to work out very exactly. well. You. Yeah. You know, yeah, you've got to become passionate about it. You got to believe the value proposition of what I'm telling you that you could have this alternative reality that you've never experienced. Like I'm, I'm getting, this is more than my short, sorry, but, and I know we're like, we've been doing this. You got time. all the time you but, want, brother. This, but, this is great. Boy, if we, this is the invention I want you because you're probably smart at this to come up with a virtual reality experience where people step in and they step into a suit and for 10 minutes they experience what it would be like to have a hundred percent healthy high-performing mind and body what oh it would gosh. feel like to them right for 10 minutes suddenly all the pain and ache and gut issues to go away their mind to light up and click on with focus and attention and enhanced sensation right not fake right like just really what yeah. is possible like what it would feel like to suddenly have their breath properly restored and their body in alignment and in balance and boy if they walked out of that experience i promise you this what do i have to do to have that please tell me right and if yeah. i could give them that experience if they could really taste what it is i'm offering then i wouldn't have to fight the fight they just yeah. go for it be like yeah. i can't I, I gotta have that <laughs> you know and i'd be yeah. like well you can have that but this is the journey you're going to have to go on and it's going to take a while right? Depending yeah. on where you start from. And so, yeah, I go through the mind into the stress systems and into the fundamentals of nutrition. It is not a specific diet. It's not a keto diet or a paleo diet. I think all of those can be good diets. Uh, depending on your situation, I might recommend those. It is a fundamentals of eating. This is what applies to all diets if you want to be healthy, right? And then physical activity and sleep. And then finally, of course, towards the end, the purpose chapter, right? Like you, you got to feel like you're here for a reason. Yep. If you're going to make this investment in health, because the time we live in, you will be swimming upstream to embrace all these practices, to have this experience of health that I'm describing for you. And I made it as simple as I felt like I could make it at the time, the simplest, most elementary. And thankfully, Jason, what I've heard, because I wrote it for my patients, originally just started off as a series of PDFs to teach them these fundamentals, mm -hmm. and then finally got bundled into a book. And I give it away. It's available for free online. Mm -hmm. um, and not the hard copies, you have to buy those off Amazon or whatever. But I have now had thousands of people read that book and write to me. Well, not everyone's written to me, but I know thousands have read it and many have written to me and just said, it changed their life. Yeah. And, it was the, and it was the people whose lives I wanted to change, the school teachers, the firemen, the plumb, all the regular good old folks in our communities that make our communities work, who are trying hard and showing up every day and raising their families, but do not have the resources to like access all this other stuff about health. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And that's why it's exactly why I use that as a segue talking about just walking, getting in sunshine to the book, because that's what people need to hear. And like I, I was talking to a, a, a buddy last night and he was asking me about, you know, what I do to stay in shape. And, and look, I'm in the sweet spot. I found the sweet spot. Uh, my body fat is <laughs> some of Jimlin's employees. They laughed the other day because they were like, you know, because they know that I obsess over my health and like, you know, what are your goals for this year? This is back in uh, January. I said, well, you know, I'm trying to, this is the year of the guitar. I'm learning to play the guitar, you know, and to, and to continue to grow the podcast. stuff. So I said, but health wise, I'm right where I want to be. You know, there's always room for improvement for sure, but I'm kind of in this sweet spot. But what I told this buddy last night, is like, but man, I know it from the outside, it looks like this hardcore discipline and I must really watch every gram of what I eat. And I'm always working out and whatever. It's like, no, to what you just said, it's built up. It's once I realized the if I take the right control, how good it can feel, then it's then it becomes easy because the 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 feedback loop is like every day waking up and feeling great and sleeping well and and being able to not crave big giant meals or it's just so no I mean when you see me and heavens knows I, I'm no Greg Avedon or anything like, I'm not a Ben Greenfield you know I mean come on that dude is a you know you know yeah. Michelangelo couldn't have chiseled anything better than that guy <laughs> but that's not me but you know I, I just want people to know it's what you see with Jason Wright as a healthy guy I'm healthy and I look healthy but man it's a result of just because it feels so good to be this healthy that yeah, I enjoy the struggle. I enjoy the I enjoy the delayed dopamine hit that comes after the struggle. 
which by the way, I don't know if you saw this a while back, um, Andrew Huberman, the Stanford uh, neuroscientist did a, uh, did a, it was, he did something on his podcast or maybe it was something I read and I, I wrote a subsequent article about how we've gotten so trained for these really short span, uh, these, these, there's a, the delta between one dopamine hit and the next is so, is shrinking thanks to yep. social media and stuff. We can just have, so, so I actually did an article and I, and I illustrated this little picture of a PDA as an IV drip, you know, just mm -hmm. because it's like, it's like this constant little drip of dopamine. And, you know, if you'll switch that to something more challenging on the other side of it, there's plenty of dope to go around and it's legal. It's natural. You can, your body can create it, and uh, and it and it does, and it helps to remove a lot of the struggle of all this thing that people hear what we're talking about and they go, I just can't do that. You know, you can go for a walk. You know, you can do ten, you can do twenty air squats before a meal. You can do it. And when you see the result of these simple things, it really has a profound impact. So I'm actually, I think I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab your book and uh, I've got this my first uh, cohort going through the six week Vitruvian challenge, which is basically just kind of a an immersion into the surface level of all these things you and I are talking about, mm -hmm. habit formation, breath work, mindfulness, gut health. You know, it's a week I've created on each. And I think that, um, so if any of them are listening, then congratulations. So you're, you're going to get Dr. Gus's book as part of uh, the uh, beta cohort. So not only do you get my program for a dollar there, they, they, I had to charge them a dollar so that my Stripe uh, payment processing deal would, would test it. So they're getting that for this. It's just a test run, but they're also going to get, uh, your book, Dr. Gus. So very I cool. I appreciate that. And again, if anybody in the audience would like to read it, I, I I'm happy to give the link where they can go get an e-copy at no charge. If that's all right. Absolutely. But shoot yeah. that to me and we'll put that in the show notes. That'd be, yeah. that'd be yeah. fantastic. All right. Well, Dr. Gus, dude, I have taken up so much of your time and this has been, this is far exceeded my already high expectations for this conversation. And uh, I thank you so much for sharing your vast wisdom and knowledge with this audience, man. Man, thank you, Jason. I've loved this conversation. It's so fun to jam out together with somebody this who cool. like, sees it the way I do, because a lot of times people just think I'm crazy about health, yeah, <laughs> and I <yeah>. am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm the same. And, but you know what? Praise the Lord. We're finally to a point where someone like you, a, a licensed physician, is going, Hey, there's more to more to this than diagnose prescribe. It's a okay, diagnosed, but then let's take a long term holistic approach. So I'm encouraged in guys like you that are actual healthcare professionals. The what you're saying, man, I'm encouraged. And so hopefully we'll just get all of us lay people like me out here, you know, grabbing on, realizing, hey, this is this is cool stuff. So Love it, man. And we got to have you back on. Please, please don't be a stranger to the show, brother. I want to, I want to get you back on and I, accept um, the invitation. I, I, I love it. And good luck to, uh, to your daughters as, as uh, I guess both of them, they're twins, right? So you got two. Yes. Trying to, yeah. Okay, two of so. them that are touring colleges right now. So yeah. God bless you, brother. There's light at the end of my tunnel, but uh, you, you know, you shall prevail. <laughs> <laughs> so all right. Well, Dr. Gus, oh, where can people find you? You said where they can find the book, but where can people get in touch with you and follow you and everything you're up to? Yeah. So my personal website, uh, professional is www.drgusvickery.com. That's drgusvickery.com. And that's where I post blogs. If I'm on a podcast where we post those types of things, uh, you could link to get a copy of the book there. If you want the book, it's at ebook dot drgusvickery.com free copies are there and again you can go through the personal site and our practice site because i have multiple colleagues now who all work inside the family practice some do some of the type of work that i do and some of them are just doing the traditional family medicine that i did for so long is called wild health asheville www.wildhealthashville.com and so if individuals are potentially interested in working with my colleagues and getting a blueprint for health and things like that they can go to that site and put their information in Fantastic. All right. Well, Dr. Gus, sit tight. I'm going to do a sign off for the YouTubes real quick, and then I'll be back to say goodbye to you properly. So just sit tight. Hey, folks, there you have it. Dr. Gus Vickery. Thank you so much for tuning into the Jason Wright show today. Hey, if you're listening on the podcast, please leave us a five star iTunes rating. That would mean the world to me. And then also, if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, then please subscribe 
post comments, ask Dr. Gus questions. If he doesn't check them, I'll make sure and look and I'll get to get them to him. Let's start the algorithm going and get some good conversation going on around health and wellness. And until we are together again, I challenge you to continue to improve always and always. He's Dr. Gus. I'm Jason and we're out. Thanks.